So today we're going over our uneven age for generation methods. Uh, we'll get into the regulation methods on Thursday in class. And I know regeneration method and regulation methods sound the same, but what those regulation methods are, they're how we quantitatively make decisions to implement these uneven age regeneration methods on the ground, okay? So that's what they are. Uh, so this is wrapping up our regeneration treatment unit. This will be the final week in our regeneration treatment unit. Next week, we'll move on to our establishment treatment unit. And today we're focusing a lot on the economics and ecology of these uneven age systems because these systems work very well for aesthetics. They work very well for many different societal factors. So uh, we don't have a lot of people, you know, concerned about our uneven age civil cultural systems. And so here they are, patch group and single tree selection. We're covering all three of them here today because they're all the same process. Uh, the key distinction is how big a group are you opening? And so you're opening a really large area in patch selection, you're opening a smaller area in group selection, and then by the time you get down to single tree selection, it's just, you know, you're opening up one single tree. So it's gonna be very, very small. And so let's start with an exercise here. Um, so uh, let me sort of go through the exercise and then you all can split up in groups and work on this. And so I'm gonna give you a cover type, an SAF force cover type. Um, and then what I want you to do is, you're not writing a prescription, but imagine that your cover type has been managed by someone using each of these three selection systems. So they've split it in thirds, you've got big areas, they split it in thirds and they did one third single tree selection, one third group selection, one third patch selection. So what I want you to do is imagine you've come in after a whole rotation, what is the structure and composition of each of those areas gonna look like depending on how they managed it, okay? So is there any question on what you're trying to come up with? Okay, um, so here are the four different cover types. So you can see the top two are cover types we're all probably pretty familiar with. Willow, water, laurel, oak, with some other minor species in the cover type there listed below it. Um, so that's gonna be a very common bottom line cover type around here that we've all seen. Longleaf pine scrub oak, so that area we were out on for week six in Dendro Lab where we got all the xeric species, it didn't have the longleaf, but it had that same composition of oaks. So we have a lot of these areas uh, up on Zeric ridges south of the Sam Rayburn Reservoir in our area here. Then out west, you have Doug for Western Hemlock. You might see that in California, Oregon, Washington State. Um, and it has Western Red Cedar Grand for Western White Pine in it. And then we've got the interior Ponderosa Pine, Lodgepole Pine, Western Larch cover type that you might find in Montana, Colorado, uh, that sort of Rocky Mountain, Northern Rocky Mountain area. Okay, so those are the four cover types. So go ahead and split up into your group and have each of your groups pick one of these four. Okay, so with which groups have picked willow, water, laurel oak? Just quick show of hands. We've got at least one. Longleaf pine scrub oak. We've got a couple. Uh, Doug fir, western hemlock. We've got at least one. And ponderosa pine. Okay, so we've got them all covered. Uh, so now here's some more information that may be helpful. So. Make sure you've jotted down all the species in your cover type. Make sure you know what species you're looking at. Okay, and once you've got your species, this is for the Eastern forest trees. And so for the top two groups there, and you can see white oaks and red oaks are in a group right in the middle there in intermediate shade tolerance. And on this uh, table, those blue shaded trees are the trees we tend to manage for more here in the South. So there are more valuable timber species. And I'll have a slide in just a moment for the Western uh, forest trees, same idea. Notice how everything we manage for on the south is to the right. Well, see how we don't really have a lot we manage for that's intolerant, or sorry, that's tolerant of shade. Okay, here's the western trees. Once you've figured out the shade tolerances on your species, you can start figuring out what these areas are going to look like after rotation in each of the three silvicultural systems. Okay, uh, so it sounded like you all had some uh, pretty good ideas here. So if we start at the top, the willow water laurel oak cover type. So if your group had that, what sort of shade tolerances were we looking at for those species? Yeah, so you had a pretty good range there, right? So what was your shade tolerant species there? Okay, and your intolerant species? Okay, and then everything else is pretty much what? 
intermediate, right? So you're kind of right in the middle there. And so if you're going to do a patch selection, what's that going to favor? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So it's going to be which species? Yeah, so you're going to get more nut oak and more sweet gum. So would that be a good timber stand? Probably. Would that be a decent wildlife stand? Probably, right? Okay. And then if you went the other direction, if you went with single tree selection, what would that stand look like? Okay, yeah, so your red maple is going to be real dominant. What's your green ash going to look like here pretty soon? And think bigger picture, not just this exercise. Yeah. Well, yeah, if things kept going as they normally are, but if this is out in a stand in Nacogdoches County right now, what are you thinking about doing with your green ash? Why? But what, what's happening with green ash specifically? Emerald right, we've got emerald ash borer that's likely coming, right? Um, and so a lot of folks are marking green ash to cut it out. So yeah, everything you're saying about the ecology of green ash, absolutely right. Um, but you've got this other factor, this invasive disease uh, or insect coming. Uh, so a lot of people are marking green ash to remove it right now, regardless of what the silvics are. Um, and so red, red maple generally, you know, unless you've got a landowner that wants to manage for fall foliage, you know, red maple doesn't have the same wildlife value, doesn't have the same timber value as many of these other species um, on the list. And so th this is a good take home message here with this cover type. When you go and you attempt to implement single tree selection in the US South, we saw how all those species that we really want are on the intolerant end of the spectrum. And so as we start looking at them again here, you know, when we're managing our Eastern hardwoods, look at the bottom there on the left, you know, if you try to go with a very shade heavy silvicultural system like single tree selection, you end up with hornbeam, hop hornbeam, flowering dogwood, Florida maple, like most of these aren't even overstory trees, right? They can't even make it into the overstory. And so this is why you really don't see single tree selection used in our part of the world. Some of those valuable trees like sugar maple, we just don't have here in the South. And so you don't tend to see single tree selection used too much at all in the South, especially not in our hardwoods. Uh, where it would lead to high grade. Okay, so longleaf pine and then those three oaks, blue jack, black jack, and post oak. So what are your shade tolerances on those? Well, longleaf is highly shade intolerant. So very intolerant of shade. And the oaks are on their, their intermediate. Okay, so they're all gonna be intermediate. Um, so we've been looking at shade tolerance. So as you think about these different silvicultural systems and what your stand's gonna look like after, what, what's the major factor that that probably depends upon? So managing what? Okay, so are you managing for longleaf or are you managing for oaks? Are those species of oaks people would manage for timber? They don't have the form, because they tend to grow on these real xeric sites where trees don't tend to get great form. If you're managing for wildlife, they're okay. Uh, you probably want to favor post oak. The other two have really, really irregular and sparse seed crops from what little data we have. Post oak may be a little more regular um, in terms of masting, but um, so, you know, as we look at those, we've been discussing shade tolerance. So which of the three systems would favor the longleaf pine? That would be the patch. That would be the patch selection. But again, as you think about what this forest is actually gonna look like, okay, what else do you need to know about how it was managed over the last rotation beyond just that regeneration method? Yeah, what was the fire regime, okay? So in this system, that's gonna make a huge difference where can those, are those oaks that are listed there, can they handle fire well? Those are our more pyrophytic oaks. So those are oaks that are better suited to fire. They do tend to have thicker bark and they are good at resprouting. And so you're probably never gonna get rid of them if your goal was to have all longleaf pine. There's still gonna be a component out there, but the more you can burn, it will shift you probably depending on how you do it, of course, more towards that longleaf component. So it may not just be the regeneration method that's important, it may be other factors we need to think about as well. Okay, so Douglas fir, Western Hemlock, what are your shade tolerances on those uh, trees? Okay, so now we're more on the shade tolerant of the spectrum, right? We're exactly right, Western Hemlock, Western Red Sea are very tolerant, 
Grand First Tolerant, Doug Fern, Western White Pine are intermediate. Um, so is patch selection going to regenerate that cover type with big openings? What, what would you get, do you think, if you did a patch selection? Yeah, I, I think that would favor Douglas fir. Uh, which of these species is managed most for timber out in the Pacific Northwest? Douglas fir, definitely. A lot of that is even aged plantations, right? But it can be managed on even age. And so if you wanted Doug fir to be a dominant component in this ecosystem, Patch selection is probably your best bet, right? But then in this case, what are you, what are you going to be shifting composition toward mords as you go to single tree selection? Red cedar and hemlock, right? Now, when we look at eastern hemlock here in the eastern U.S., it doesn't have much timber value. The wood breaks unpredictably, so pe people tend to shy away from it. But western hemlock's great. They use it for pylons, for piers, um, big utility poles. Western red cedar is a really unique wood, very light, very resistant to rot. Um, it's one of the lightest woods. So if we look at lavalier pine out the window here, its specific gravity will be like 0.55. Red cedar will be like 0.31. Uh, so it's almost half as light. Uh, but they use it for decking, shingles, all sorts of high-end products. Our burling log over there in the Sylvan's yard is western red cedar, for example. It's also used for utility poles. So, uh, so even if you shift that you know, towards the shade tolerant species, here these are pretty valuable shade tolerant species. So if you want to manage for timber, you know, you could kind of look at the mills in your area, what species you want to favor, and you've got choices in that cover type, right? So a lot of options there. Okay, interior ponderosa pine with lodgepole and western larch. What are our shade tolerances on those? Okay, so western larch is probably the most shade intolerant species in the western U.S. It's a classic early successional species. So as we look at these cover types, what's probably going to be most limiting to growth? These are going to be water limited systems, uh, much more so than what we see here in the east. Okay, and so are those going to be uh, high, high density forests? Are those going to be more open woodlands? What are they going to look like? Are the trees going to be packed in there like we see, you know, out the window here? And when we look at, you know, the stand over there, Tucker Woods. Are the trees going to be packed in there where you can't see through them at all? They're going to be spread out more because water is limiting, right? Okay. So with these three systems, you know, when we start thinking about shade tolerance, is that the most important aspect of the silvix? So that's what I gave you. But in that particular example, it may not be the most important aspect of the silvix. Okay. So say we are looking at patch selection. You open up a relatively large area. Okay. What are you concerned with most when you're thinking about that regeneration method? So you've opened a big area. What are you worried about in terms of the silvix of the trees next? So think about, we just did the quiz. We just looked at cone counting and longleaf pine. Why are we doing that? Seed, right? You're worried about, do you have enough seed? And so in this case, you might start thinking about, hey, you know, how am I going to get my actual seedlings out there? How am I going to get my germinating seed? And so as we start looking at the different silvics here, you know, Western Orch can be 200 feet tall, classic pioneer species, seeds dispersed by wind, pretty good distance. So Western Larch, you know, you could regenerate it with a seed tree method, which means if you have a selection system and there's some Western Larches around, you should have seed no problem. What do you know that we went over in Denver about the cones in lodgepole pine? So I think I heard someone say it. So they need fire, they're serotonous, right? And so lodgepole pine is the pine that largely came back after those fires in the 80s that burned about a third of Yellowstone, for example. And so not all, but a lot of their cones are serotonous. And so what that allows lodgepole pine to do is build up a lot of seed over a long period of time. And so if you had mature lodgepole pine and you did a patch selection and you open up a patch, you probably just put a whole bunch of lodgepole pine seed on the ground. Uh, you may need some sort of fire to help open it. But again, if you get a hot summer day and now it's on the ground and there's high light on it, a lot of them will open. So we may be talking about millions of seeds per acre there. And then ponderosa pine, you know, it's a common pine out west. It does pretty well, uh, but it's not serotonous and the seeds aren't going to disperse quite as far as western larch. So you may be a little more worried about that one in those cover types and thinking, thinking it through to make sure you have enough seed. So, so again, all sorts of different things you need to think about with implementing these selection systems um, in order to, you know, get the composition where you want it to be, right?
And so then when you're done, we haven't talked much about structure, but you get something like this, where you have trees out there in all sorts of different age classes. And so you have old trees, you have young trees, you have big trees, you have little trees, you have trees in medium sized classes. So when people talk about natural forests and diversity and all these things that, you know, give you these warm, fuzzy feelings, I think the mental image people get is of an open woodland, right? Something like Pecan Park, something like we're seeing right out this window right here. That's what people think of, or, oh, that's going to be a beautiful natural forest. But if you put a hiking trail into an uneven age stand, are you going to be able to see for long distances? No, there's going to be those dense patches of regeneration, those dense groups that are regenerating that block your view, okay? So it's going to look messy, just like an old growth forest looks messy. And I don't think most people really understand that. So it's not the aesthetics that I think most people are expecting in these systems. We've talked about disturbances, okay? So if you're managing a loblolly pine stand with this system, and they, they're doing it in Crossed, Arkansas, so not far from us, Okay, what do you think those foresters' opinions are of prescribed fire in their longleaf stand that looks like that? Or sorry, loblolly stand that looks like that? No, right? Um, so from a fire structure standpoint, what do these stands create? So they're gonna create ladder fuels, right? I mean, they create lots of ladder fuels. And so if you're out there and you've gone with this regeneration method, and it's a species like loblolly you're using that may not be well suited to fire, you know, you want to keep fire out of there at all costs. That's not in your toolbox anymore. Now, if this were short leaf or long leaf, it, it may give you some options to put fire in there because they have a different suite of adaptations that help them handle fire a little bit better, be more resilient in the face of that disturbance. But if it's loblolly, you're worried about losing your younger cohorts completely and maybe it crowning out and losing some of your older cohorts as well. Think about logging this stand. Okay, um, can you send a logger out and just have them cut what they want? This is an example where you probably want to mark timber. Okay, you probably want to put paint on trees so they know what to cut. You may even need to be a little more detailed on log trails, skid trails than you normally would. Normally you can just let the logger put those in, it may not be a big deal. But if you're a logger and you're in a feller, where are you driving your, your uh, feller? Where's the guy driving the skidder? right through that younger cohort, which is the last place you want them to go, okay? And so they're gonna drive in the opposite of the places where you want them to. So you may need to mark those out. So these may, especially in an area like the South where we don't do a lot of these traditionally, you may need to have a lot of communication with the logger at first in order to get this deployed. And then after you've worked with them for a while, you know, they start figuring it out more and more. Do you want a logger with like really big equipment that we use to clear cut pine stands or what sort of equipment do you want them to have out here, ideally? Agile, which means small. Uh, so you want to try and find someone that's got smaller equipment. That's the opposite of the way things are going right now, though, right? All the equipment keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger to be high efficiency for even-aged plantation-type forests. And so that, that's a challenge, not an insurmountable one, but something to keep in mind out here. Now, as we're talking about timber marking and, you know, logger picking trees, all these different things, we need to get into the word select, selection, selective. Um, a bunch of you got a number one circled on your prescriptions where you were writing something about a selection thin, a selection cut. And what you meant in almost every case was going to be operator select. That operator driving the feller, driving the skitter, that operator is out there and they are choosing which trees to fell in the feller. Okay, you're not marking. So the two options are a forester marks trees to cut or a logger works with the forester and the forester tells them what they want and checks them and trains them. And then the logger selects which trees are cut. And so be careful to call that operator select because what a selection thin is, we'll go over this in a few weeks. You cut the dominant trees out in your even age stand to release a lower crown class. So what forest can you think of that you've been in here in East Texas where you walked out there and said, if we cut the bigger trees and we grow the smaller trees that are underneath them, this is gonna be a really nice stand. So have you ever thought that? I've never seen the stand like that in the South anywhere. We don't have those types of stands because again, look at what is in our lower crown positions. It's species that can't make it into the dominant crown position because they are mid-story trees or think about the pines you've seen and the oaks you've seen that are growing in those mid-story crown positions. 
they have terrible crown form. They're never going to be a nice tree, okay? And so we don't even use selection logging, but it has that specific definition of cutting the biggest trees to grow the smaller trees in your stand, okay? And so then, you know, depending on how you apply these term selections, they may not have a lot of meaning. It may lead to high grading, cut the best and leave the rest, which we don't want. That's the opposite of silviculture. Um, and so really the only times you should use selection is make sure you use operator select if the logger is choosing what trees to cut down. Selection thinning is a correct term, but it's for a type of thinning we don't do in the South because we don't have the right species. So you shouldn't be using that on a prescription. And then we've got these three systems we're talking about today, our three selection regeneration methods. And so that's an appropriate use of, of silviculture and the term selection. So any questions on selection, selective? If you have a bunch of trees that are like marked with that blue mark uh -huh. to be taken out, what would you call that when you have a bunch of trees? You've well, marked the stand. You've marked the stand, but you're doing one of these eight regeneration methods or you're doing one of the thinning methods we'll go over later. So marking is how you implement what we're discussing. It's not a separate system in and of itself. It's just how, it's the how. This is the what, that's the how. Yeah. Okay, so with these uneven age systems, what they're gonna do for you is they're gonna leave canopy cover out there at all times. And then compared to our even age systems, are they gonna produce more overall volume? Which are you gonna get more volume out of, an even age system or an uneven age system? Even age systems are going to produce more volume. But if you're on a really long rotation, 150 year rotation, would you rather produce a little volume at a high frequency or every 150 years you produce a lot of volume? You, you, you probably want smaller harvest, but much more frequently. That makes more sense for the landowner. That makes more economic sense. Um, and so if you're gonna get less, you know you're gonna get less, why don't you try and get the best quality that you can out of this, okay? So what these systems are really designed to do is produce high quality saw timber and veneer products. So you're not maxing out volume, but you are trying to max out quality and you're trying to give yourself periodic harvests and therefore income in an area where you've got a much longer rotation where your trees are gonna be slow growing. So again, another reason we don't see these deployed a lot in the South is because we have shorter rotations because we have longer growing seasons. Um, we're seeing all these commercials about fall and everything like that. And we're getting lucky, you know, this week, but we know next week it's going to be 95 degrees again, right? So, um, so you know, up north, you know, it's actually getting cold. The leaves are actually starting to fall off the trees. So much shorter growing seasons. With all these uneven age systems, and we've talked about this when we talked about diameter distributions, the stand you actually have and the stand you're going to have most of the time is there on the bottom. You have an irregular uneven age stand where you didn't get some regeneration in some years, you're missing some cohorts, you have an overabundance of other cohorts, it's a very messy forest. The stand you want and the stand you're managing for is on top, that reverse J-shaped curve that characterizes a balanced all age stand. Because if you can get there, your life is easier. You do the same thing at the same interval over and over and over again, rinse and repeat, it's easy, and you keep getting those good products out. But you're probably never gonna get there. That's your goal, but as with anything in forestry, you're constantly checking, you're constantly readjusting to whatever really happens on the ground. A hurricane comes through, you gotta come up with a new plan, right? So, so that's your goal, but you're probably never gonna get there, but you know, you're trying to get there. Here's a bunch of differences between the, these different silvicultural systems. We talked about the economic returns, where it's not that one's better than the other, it's that there's a trade-off depending on the scenario. Um, but as we look at these, there's one thing that kind of is counterintuitive. So just right off the top of your head, am I getting more erosion from group selection or clear cutting? Clear cutting, that's super easy, right? But when we think about it, it's actually kind of counterintuitive. They've actually done studies on this. And in the Southern Appalachians, they found more erosion coming from group selection than they did from even aged methods like a shelter work. And so that, that doesn't make sense, right? So what's happening, think back to the clear cutting lecture, where does most of the erosion come from in our forestry operations? Roads, it comes from the roads. So if you're in an area on a long rotation, a hundred year rotation, and you clear cut it, 
your roads are closed for a long time. Maybe you come and thin once or twice, but then you're back in clear cutting 100 years later, your roads are closed for most of that time. Now switch to group selection, you're in there every 10 or 15 years, opening your roads back up, opening your roads back up, opening your roads back up, that's where your erosion's coming from, getting the big equipment back in there. And so you can actually get more erosion off these selection systems just because your road network keeps getting reopened um, versus an even age system. So that, that's very counterintuitive, but we have to keep in mind the harvest area is not the problem. The harvest area is not what's causing most of our erosion. So. The other thing we have to start thinking about is some of our terms get funky when we start talking uneven age systems. Rotation length is one, okay? Clear cutting, it's easy. You clear cut to your next clear cut, that's your rotation length, easy. You've cut all the trees pretty much. But with these systems, you're not even really going by age. You're using structure to do a lot of this. You don't care how old the trees are, but you need to come up with some sort of rotation length to help you manage how often you're harvesting and how much of that stand you're harvesting at each entry to keep it sustainable. And so really it's just how long does it take you on average to get to your target crop tree, okay? So in theory, if I have a 100 acre stand and I cut 10 acres every 10 years, what rotation am I on? So I'm out there cutting 10 acres every 10 years. I've got a 100 acre stand. How long does it take me to cut the whole thing? 100 years. My rotation length is 100 years. That sounds very easy in our heads. We can all picture, I'm going to cut this 10 acre block. And then 10 years later, I'm going to cut this 10 acre block. And you could go through it like an engineer very logically. And boom, you're then you're back to the first one 100 years later, 100 year rotation. That's not how this works in the field. In the field, you go out there. And after a few entries of doing this, even in an even age stand that you're converting to uneven age, you have no idea which are my 10 year old trees, 20 year old, 30 year old. You can guess, but you have no idea. It, it's a mess. It's a very messy looking system. And so you're not out there saying, I need to cut the 100 year old trees. You're out there saying, these trees are mature and meet my product specs. We're cutting them and we're regenerating this area right here. Those trees aren't mature yet. We can thin this area maybe at this entry, but we're going to keep growing the best ones towards the end of the rotation. And so as you do that, managing by structure and not age time after time, you might end up with some areas in your stand that have 150 year old trees. You just, for whatever reason, didn't get to them. You might have other areas where you're harvesting 70 year old trees and they're you know, good, high quality trees. And so it's just a concept now that helps you implement it in the fields more than it is you know, in a clear cut, you know the rotation length, it is what it is. There's not much doubt there. There's nothing to really argue about with it, right? But here it's more a concept. And then that helps you define your cutting cycle. How often do you need to go in to implement this? And so when you go in there, you regenerate some areas, but other areas you may be doing tending operations. And so as you're doing all this to get that sustained yield, you need to harvest mature trees, but you're also gonna harvest some smaller trees. And to do all that and make it work, you need good, timber cruising. You need to go out there and do a good job estimating your volumes and have a real accurate standard stock table, okay? From an ecological standpoint, just an ecological standpoint, do you need to see a standard stock table to do a clear cut and make it work out and get good regeneration? Not at all, especially if you're planting trees. Who cares what was, you know, the, what the volume on the stump was before the harvest? You may need to know the species to know if you're gonna have a problem where undesirable trees are regenerating, right? But if you're planting trees, spray it, plant them, you're good to go, okay? Now, operationally, you absolutely needed to know what that volume was to implement the clear cut because you want to put it out for bid and get the landowner a fair price for their timber. So operationally, you do need a good inventory, but ecologically, you don't. Here with our uneven age systems, if you don't have that good inventory, you're going to start screwing up your harvest and you're going to go from that irregular uneven age diameter distribution to an even more irregular uneven age diameter distribution. And you have a significant risk of high grading, of over harvesting the best trees so that 10 years from now, you just don't have them out there. 20 years, you're going to have a problem for a long time. So you need that good inventory. But again, to avoid high grading, you have to know what's out there. And then you have to cut the worst, leave the best. High grading is cut the best, leave the rest. So it's the opposite of that. And then you have to make sure that you're tending other areas in between. And so it requires a completely different frame of mind. 
where we've sort of done a space for time substitution. So instead of going out into this stand, doing my regeneration treatment, leaving, coming back, doing my establishment treatments over the whole area, leaving, coming back, doing my intermediate treatments over the whole area, leaving, coming back. What you do now is instead of that time being different, space is different. You come in and you do all your regeneration, establishment, and intermediate treatments you need all on that stand all at once, but you do them in different little locations on the stand. You regenerate some patches, you tend to other patches that are older. And so you do it all in these different spaces, but all at once with the cutting cycle. So it's a completely different concept. And so this is what it might look like. So in one of those videos, y'all will be viewing for the, um, the mean annual increment lecture, mini lecture, you see that logistic growth curve and I'll go over that and explain why that is the way it is. But as we look at that on the left, you clear cut the stand, then you do your establishment treatments, you go through that slow growth phase, the lag phase at first, then you get to the intermediate treatments in the middle of the rotation where it's growing rapidly. It gets up there towards the top, towards carrying capacity, boom, clear cut it again. Now look at the right. It's a completely different concept where you go in there and all at once you do everything and then 10 years later you go back and you do the same exact thing again, just in slightly different locations on the stand. And you never go down to zero in terms of your biomass on the y-axis there. So it really is a different concept. Okay, so we've looked through these different systems. Here's patch selection. And so the most important things there are it's an uneven age regen method and you're creating large openings for shade intolerant species. Okay, and we saw that in our little exercise. And so the dividing line is you want them to be open greater than twice the height of the surrounding trees. And that's so you can control the light environment. Okay. So we do this a lot in the south. This works in pine. I've seen it in pine. This works in hardwood. Okay. You can think of this as clear cutting on a small spatial scale. The only difference is we've changed how we define a stand. The stand is not the whole harvested area. The stand is now that whole picture where we've harvested smaller portions of it. So it's business as usual. We've just changed our definition of our stand and we're doing it on a little bit of a smaller scale. So patch selection works real well in the South. Loggers understand it. We could implement this very easily if it meets your landowner objectives. Group selection is kind of the same thing. The difference is those openings are smaller than twice the height because you're trying to favor more intermediate to tolerant species from a shade standpoint. And so here's an example out in Colorado in Engelman spruce and subalpine fir. There's a lot of shade down in that group, right? So if you open these up pretty small, you can still get a lot of shade in them. This works in bottomland hardwoods. We're seeing a lot of wildlife management agencies at the state and federal level in the South trying to implement group selection to shift even aged forests to uneven aged forests. So we build in more structural diversity and therefore hopefully a greater diversity of wildlife. And so we are seeing this commonly applied in the south uh, in our hardwoods. I took this photo out in Oregon a couple of years ago. Those trees were 200 feet tall. So when your trees are 200 feet tall, that's too small an opening to get much light on the forest floor. I mean, imagine how many hours a day the sun's going to be over that little opening, like 15 minutes, right? You're not getting much light on the forest floor. So what they found out there is if they don't have an opening at least three quarters of an acre in size, they get zero regeneration. And again, Doug fir is intermediate in shade tolerance, right? And so when your trees are 200 feet tall, this is why we're tying it to the height of the tree. You need a much bigger opening to get the same light environment you need if your trees are 100 feet tall, like most of our trees in this part of the world. So here's an example of ponderosa pine. So again, we talked about this, y'all thought through that. So this is that water limited system. Look how open that area is. You have that dense regenerating cohort in the bottom middle of the photograph here, but still it's not like a dense regenerating co cohort of lava like pine would be around here where you can't even walk through it, right? You need a machete. And so water limited system, you got to think about them being structured very differently and these treatments doing different things. Just to show you it works anywhere in the world, there's an example in Vagus sylvatica. European beach uh, out in Hungary. And if you look in the background, there's your beach regenerating in the group in the background. In the foreground, you can see all the shade those mature trees are leaving. And sure enough, no regeneration under those mature trees. So again, it's gonna be a very messy looking stand with these selection systems. 
And so we'll get into our regulation methods a little bit more, but area regulation is gonna work really well with these. Um, where with group or patch selection, you can get to that idea where I need to harvest X percent of my stand in a given year, and I'm gonna do that, you know, 20 acres of harvesting in 21 acre patches. And so you can very easily use area to sort of figure out how you're gonna make this work. And then all you have to do is go mark out the areas the logger's gonna cut, and maybe mark out the skid trails between them, and you're good, okay? So pretty easy to implement all in all. Now, when you mark out groups or when you mark out patches, you have to think about the light environment. We're in the Northern hemisphere, the sun is in the South for us. And so we get uh, uh, you know, differences in the light environment, depending on where you are within a gap. We can change our gap shapes. We can make them you know, east-west, we can orient them north-south. They don't have to be circles, they don't have to be rectangles. You know, we can make them irregular. And so that's gonna influence, you know, how the sun interacts on the forest floor there and how it favors regeneration. So think about how we were discussing, you know, regenerating some of these different groups. And some of those groups, the water willow laurel oak group, you had the shade tolerant red maple, the shade intolerant sweet gum. Well, if you look in that opening, you may get the sweet gum regenerating on one side of the gap at the top of the slide here, and you may get the red maple more regenerating at the bottom of the slide there. So you may, have an opening that favors a few different light environments. Okay, you may get undesirable species. So in that example I just gave, maybe you don't want the red maple in there. Maybe you want to treat it. Are you gonna broadcast herbicide over the top of these stands? Usually no, because these are almost always mixed stands. And because they're mixed, you may not have an herbicide that keeps your crop tree safe and kills your weed species only. And so you may need to go with individual stem treatments such as hack and sport. Okay, with all of these, again, I've talked about this. It gets very difficult to find your old groups and your old patches. Manage it by structure, don't manage it by age. And it should work well for whatever your different objectives are. Okay, so has anyone heard of patch clear cutting? So patch clear cutting, there's that same photo again. If you define all the cut areas as one stand and all the uncut areas as another stand, so stand A is cut, but stand A is not contiguous. It breaks our definition of a stand a little bit, then you would call that patch clear cutting. So when you hear patch clear cutting, ask more questions, figure out what they're doing, but it could very much look like patch selection on the ground, okay? And so most foresters prescribing this in the South are probably gonna call it patch clear cutting. They're not gonna call it patch selection but it gives you the same thing. It's just the bookkeeping on it's a little different, that's all, so. Okay, that leads us to single tree selection and single tree selection is kind of a different animal. If you walked out and you see that photo on the top and the aerial sort of drawing on the bottom there, if you walked out into that stand, what would you say had just been done? You don't know anything about the stand, you walk out there, you see the stumps, you see the tops they left out in the woods, it's clear they've just harvested, it looks like this now, what would you think that they'd done? High grade? They'd thin it. That looks like a thin. If they had cut the best trees and done it wrong, it could be a high grade. But we think of that as thinning, right? Are you, are you going to get regeneration in those little gaps around here? No, the canopies are going to close in a couple years and you're not going to get a lot of regeneration. So in the south, you know, that looks like a thin. But again, you go up to the lake states or the northeast and you're working with species like sugar maple. And now you have a very shade tolerant, very desirable species that can regenerate in a single tree gap and this is a regeneration method. Operationally, it looks a lot like a thing, okay? And so you really gotta be careful not to damage your residual stand here with a single tree selection because you're trying to harvest trees of all size classes, well distributed throughout the stand. It's a challenging logging operation, right? And so here's some applications of that single tree selection system before and after the cut. And again, to us, that looks like a thin in the South because we don't have single tree selection working very much in the South. Uh, I've seen it in La Valley Pine in Crosset, Arkansas, just Forest Service as an experiment, uh, but uh, you know, there's not much operational deployment of this system. And this is why, you know, <laughs> that's a tiny gap. That was one tree. And so that's what it would look like in some of these sugar maple cover types up in Wisconsin. And that's what it looks like on the ground. You really don't see much light coming in there at all. Yeah, well. How much do you usually uh, harvest from a stand in single tree selection? Well, again, you're, you have it on a cutting cycle. So you may be coming in every 15 years. 
So it's a lighter harvest, but it's a more frequent harvest. Um, and they have different systems and we'll get into that next class. We'll get into the regulation methods that tell you how much can I harvest at each entry. Look at all the shade in this spruce fir stand in Maine. So these may be systems that create very, very heavy shade. Here's that example I told you about in Crosset, Arkansas. So what they figured out here is this works, yes, but you have to dramatically reduce your expectations on stocking. The older trees are gonna have a major suppression effect on the younger trees. And so, you know, if you thought you were gonna be growing a stand at six tons per acre per year, with this system, you may take that down to two or one. It's gonna be much lower. So you're dramatically lowering your mean annual increment or whatever method you're using to track growth. Here's an example in Sierra Nevada mixed conifers. You, you see much regeneration there? No, so you still have the same considerations we've been thinking about all along. Is the litter layer gonna be a problem? Do I need bare mineral soil for my seed bank? So you have to get that you know, establishment ecology all figured out and right for whatever your system is. So it's gonna be a very shade tolerant species. We've seen a handful of examples in the South. I included Missouri, not really the South, but closer to us than most other places that are using this. And again, they've used it for a long time, but you've got to dramatically lower your expectations on stocking. Every time they've tried this in bottom land hardwoods, it has led to high grading. And then with single tree selection, this individual tree application of herbicide may become even more important to help control your composition out there. And so there's an example of a tree damaged in a logging operation. So these logging operations are very difficult, very complex. They need a lot of timber marking and there's a lot of potential downside if you don't have a really good logger out on this job. So the loggers, even the loggers driving the skitter out in these systems, they really need to know what they're doing, be top notch to implement this effectively. And then the last thing to wrap it up, there's no reason you can't combine any two or all three of these. If you wanna regenerate a mix of species, you can open some single tree gaps for the really shade tolerant ones. You can open some groups for the intermediate ones. You can open a few patches for the big ones. So it'd be more complicated, but if you wanna combine all three of these spatially out on a stand and it met your landowner objective, why not? So this is an example in Maine where they combine group selection and single tree selection. So, so there's an introduction to the uneven age regeneration methods for you. And again, next class we'll get into the regulation methods, which is how you implement